The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on Q&A, the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Patty Stonecipher, discusses her newest career as president of Martha's Table, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit food pantry and family services charity. Patty Stonecipher, CEO of Martha's Table. What is it? Martha's Table is a wonderful community-based organization that was founded 33 years ago with the idea that everyone deserves dignity and opportunity, and so we provide food supports, clothing supports, but also early child care and after school care to ensure opportunity for those in our community in the Washington DC. What area do you serve? We really provide food supports all over the city. We say we want to meet people where they are and hunger is everywhere. So we go into the public schools and run uh, grocery style markets towards the end of the month when we know food stamps and families bills are, are, are challenging and so in terms of food, we are everywhere, 14 different locations, in fact. But in terms of the child care and the after school program, we're at the corner of 14th and V in Washington. Now, you came from a rather diverse career before you got here. How long did you serve Microsoft in uh, the state of Washington? Well, I was in the tech field for about 20 years and about 10 of those at Microsoft and in the other Washington, as we like to say. How'd you get into the tech? I was always someone who was fascinated by journalism and the written word. I was, a, a, you know, an, a letter writer. A, a, uh, I, I loved to write. My family encouraged my writing, and so I went to school thinking I would be a journalist. But I dropped out of school uh, when putting a husband through school. Ended up having two children and got off the journalism track. But writing was a skill that was highly valued, and the tech world was booming. And the combination of being great at math, good at technology, and good at writing and communicating brought me the opportunity to move into this new era of microcomputing early on and I just gravitated towards it and the opportunities were so great that that became my career. How does someone who's one of nine children from Indianapolis get into writing? Where does that come from? Who spurred that on? Well, my parents were very good at keeping us busy. <laughs> and in addition to an awful lot of, uh, of, of school activities and social service activities, I was always writing relatives. And my mother encouraged that greatly. And then those relatives would write back beautiful letters, elderly aunts in nursing homes and cousins across the country. And I just got to where that was something I was encouraged. I was always a chatty child. In fact, they called me Chatty Patty after the Chatty Kathy doll when I was little, uh, but putting that chattiness into writing was encouraged and, uh, and reinforced through the ongoing communication that I had with a whole series of adults. So how about those nine, eight siblings? Where are they? My family is, is uh, all over the country and they are tied together by one thing, which is my family was Roman Catholic, right? We were raised in the Catholic Church and everybody took something different from that experience, but the one thing almost everyone took was this idea of social justice. Our family was very tied to that. So I have several brother I have two brothers that are lawyers, a brother that's a physician's assistant, um, a lot of them doing teaching in academia, um, a, a sister doing social service with the homeless in New Orleans, a whole range of ways that each of them found to return to society some of the benefits that they'd been given. So where did the idea that social justice was important come from? It's clear to me that it did come out of my parents' faith. We lived just a few blocks from the local church and, you know, putting new missiles in the church every Saturday in preparation for Sunday church was part of what we did. And we didn't think of it as volunteerism when we went to the soup kitchen and and uh, did the dishes while the adults did the, the cooking. We didn't think of it as 
uh, social service when my dad would spend the few hours that he had after working two jobs to drive the bus to pick up the deaf children for for Sunday Mass. This was just part of what they perceived as their relationship to the community, and they passed that on to us. And I think I was probably in college before I even really uh, thought about this in a more abstract way as volunteerism, as social service, as part of being a citizen and returning back to society. We just saw it as you took care of your siblings, you took care of your family, you took care of your neighbors, and if there was anything left after that, you took care of the broader community. You were the sixth of nine I was the sixth. In Italian families, they would say that was in the sauce, but in Irish Catholic families, we didn't like to use that phrase. <laughs> Mom and dad did what? Uh, my dad was a car salesman and an auto dealership manager. My mom was trained as a physical therapist, but when there were nine of us at home and often foster children in addition to that, she did actually stop working for a few years, but then returned as visiting nurse and physical therapist as soon as my youngest brother was in school. I read somewhere where you're, there's a, um, is it a soup kitchen named after your father? The food pantry in uh, the north side of Indianapolis, the St. Vincent de Paul food pantry, is uh, in part named after my father because he was a very, very active volunteer and he helped turn what had been a whole series of churches uh, doing great works out the back door of the church providing food supports into a grocery style pantry after seeing one in Seattle and realizing that it provided more dignity, more choice, more opportunity for both better diet but also just better self-respect if instead of handing folks a bag full of the foods you have available they could come in and shop and so on the north side of Indianapolis thousands of families a month are actually at the Pratt Quigley St. Vincent de Paul pantry um, being able to shop in the same ways that Martha's Table is trying to achieve here in Washington DC. Knock down uh, anything that you want to, and I'm going to say, uh, I would assume if your father was an auto salesman, he never made a lot of money. No, in fact, he often was working two jobs in order to make enough money to keep those nine children in the parochial schools. And uh, no, he, he never made a, a lot of money. We never really thought we didn't have enough, but there was never any extra. Did you go to Butler that you dropped out of in Indianapolis and then you went to uh, Indiana University, Purdue at Fort Wayne? That's right. I went to Butler University, which was just a few blocks from where my parents were living at that time on a scholarship, actually on a journalism scholarship for a, a departed sports writer, Anthony Angelopoulos. Uh, I was on a, a scholarship in his name. And when I dropped out and got married, um, I returned to school after my first a child was born, my son, and he would go to the daycare at the IU Purdue Extension there in Fort Wayne, and I went and assembled the credits to finish my degree. The reason I asked that, though, is Dad had nine kids, he had foster kids in the house, never made a lot of money, but all of a sudden, Patty Stonecipher made a lot of money with Microsoft. What did that, what, what happened to your head when that happened? Well, it was a great surprise. I went to Microsoft and moved my family from Indianapolis to Seattle because, number one, I thought it was a beautiful place to raise children. Um, the, the, both the vibe of Seattle, but also the opportunity to experience the outdoors in a new way. And then I saw Microsoft as a place that was really committed to and passionate about one of the two values I hold dearest. We already talked about social justice, but the other one was increasing knowledge. And as a student who didn't get to continue a classic academic career, this idea that of a computer on every desk and in every home, and of every child having access to the encyclopedia, of taking away that data from the mainframe held by few and putting it on the desktops of everyone, was extremely exciting to me. So I had been working at a computer book publisher in Indianapolis when Microsoft went looking for grown-ups. It was, uh, you know, in the in the late in the mid to late 80s and they were realizing that they were going to be a very large organization in very short time and here I was a 30-year-old with a great track record and they came recruiting and I thought this was an opportunity to both do work that matched my passion for increasing knowledge and at the same time, move to a community and an environment that I thought would be wonderful to raise two children. What was your first job there? 
I, be I went in as the uh, editor and publisher of Microsoft Press, a small book publishing division. But I only did that for maybe a year, a year and a half uh, before moving to Microsoft Canada to become the general manager of Microsoft's work across Canada. Then did that for another year and a half or so, moved back to run worldwide technical support, and then ended in my last job there, which was senior vice president of the of interactive media. I like to say that um, I was in charge of development, uh, research and development and, and marketing for a whole range of products, but I like to say that if you had a really good time using a Microsoft product, that was probably one of mine. If you were getting a lot of work done, that belonged to the Office division or the Windows division, but I had everything in that group from the keyboard and the joystick to Encarta and Publisher and the small business products and uh, all of that wonderful new multimedia and this little thing called the internet. So what product over the time that you were there at Microsoft uh, would we know about, would the average person know about, uh, what, would, what would it be? Well, one, Encarta, the, uh, the encyclopedia that changed really the dynamics of encyclopedia, and then Wikipedia came in and changed the dynamics once again. But at the time that I joined Microsoft, Encarta was just an idea on a whiteboard, the idea that you could get an encyclopedia on a couple of disks on a PC and that it could be available and accessible to everyone. That was a crazy idea. And now, of course, we see something even bolder and braver and, and, and more ubiquitous in, in Wikipedia. Um, but one product that I'm very proud of, it, uh, because it, it still is having such an impact every day, is Slate. And uh, uh, Slate was, was, uh, was this idea from Michael Kinsley, who became my husband. He came to Microsoft and sold the idea, first to Steve Ballmer and then to the rest of us that were on his interview loop, that there really was an opportunity for those who were interested in politics and culture, um, but were... Um, but would have more availability on the internet and that it would improve the economics but also improve the numbers of people who had access and engaged in these ideas. Might as well do this now. We've got some video of your husband and for those, in the, and I'm sure most of our audience will know, Michael Kinsley. Here, is, here he is. Good. Uh, Slate, he was the founding editor of Slate, the online magazine, uh, Politico and The Atlantic. So what do you like best about your job? Um, well, I like, right now I'm just writing a column. Um, I like that because, you know, you can read something in the paper and instead of having to get in line to call C-SPAN, you, uh, you can write it up and there it is. You have a megaphone. Yes, and, um, but editing, which I miss a little bit, is, is the joy of that is leverage. If you get an idea, if you get five ideas, you can assign them all, whereas you couldn't write them. So what's the backstory on this relationship? Where, how did you two get together at Microsoft? Well, I got, I got divorced after, after 20 years of a great relationship that started in, in my early college days. Um, and uh, Microsoft uh, was really entering this new world of multimedia, what we called at that time, looking for people who were gr talented at content. And Michael really actually wrote a letter to his old uh, friend, Steve Ballmer, who he'd known in, in college years, saying, hey, I hear you're looking for journalists. I'm thinking about this new idea. What do you think? And Steve encouraged him to get on a plane and come out. And I met Mike when he came out and, and was literally going door to door, doing an interview loop at Microsoft. And he had all of these tough interviewers because the Microsoft interview process was notoriously demanding, you know, asking the tough question, trying to narrow in on the person's weaknesses or ideas. And, uh, but there was this special idea at the end of the Microsoft uh, interview loop called the as appropriate person. And the as appropriate person is not on your schedule when you start interviewing. But if everybody loves you, they send in somebody at the end who turns on the charm and talks about how wonderful it would be if you came to Microsoft, if you were to move across the country to Seattle. And I was Mike's as appropriate. He didn't know at that time that I was doing my job by being that charming person versus is all the people that have been tough and inquisitive all day. But that began a relationship that developed over several years of great friendship. And I had such admira admiration for his writing already. But turns out that in addition to his writing, he's just this marvelous uh, man and the opportunity to spend time with him in Seattle. And then eventually uh, we, we married and have been married for the last 11 years. 
He's had a rough uh, time with Parkinson's, uh, although much better in 2012 than he was earlier. Uh, how's he doing? Well, we we benefit, Mike in particular benefited from, you know, all the developments in both the pharmaceutical industry, but also these medical devices. And that uh, six years ago now, he had uh, deep brain stimulation surgery, which is now used not commonly, but relatively frequently to address Parkinson's and other neurological symptoms. He has two pacemakers uh, and, and wires that go into his brain that help control the Parkinson's uh, signals. He's the first one to jump on the bike when the weather is nice outside. He's the first one in the gym in the morning, often there at 5.15 in the morning to make sure that he maintains his health and keeps his energy high. So we're really lucky. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's over 20 years ago. And his story is one of great success. And as you know, he's writing some of the best stuff he's ever written, whether it's in the New York Times Book Review or in the New Republic or others. So uh, I think he would say that uh, he, got, he got lucky in that he uh, was diagnosed with this disease during a time when the medical improvements and knowledge was just rapidly increasing. You were his boss? I was his boss for a brief period of time. He, he, he likes to joke that he ran off a lot of bosses at Microsoft, but I left about six months after uh, Slate was launched uh, with the idea that I was going to join DreamWorks Interactive. I'd been at Microsoft a long time. I'd made more money, as you, as you noted, than I ever dreamed. And I knew that uh, that job had run its course for me, and I was eager to see what the next thing was. But I also had two teenagers and eager to spend a bit more time with them before they left the house. Were you also Melinda French's boss? I was. Now tell everybody who she is. So Melinda French Gates is well, probably the best manager that ever worked for me. Uh, she ran a wide range of products, including Expedia, um, Publisher, um, Encarta, uh, a range of great products that are still in use today, and was the general manager of a business unit that was in my uh, division. And she had come right out of a college. She got her master's and her undergraduate work at Duke. And she uh, likes to tease that she's the one in the family with uh, with the two degrees. Uh, Bill never got even one, although I think he's gotten a couple of honorary degrees now. And they dated uh, during the time that I was at Microsoft and then got married. Um, uh, and, and she quit when her first child was born, in part, of course, because uh, of Bill's leadership at Microsoft, but also because I think they were beginning to realize that philanthropy would be a big part of their life. And between raising the children, dealing with that busy life that comes with being the um, part of this Microsoft juggernaut, and then starting on the philanthropy, she chose to, to stop working then. Do, do you remember the publicity that Bill Gates was getting years ago that criticized him for not giving his money away? And did that have an impact on him that ended up starting the Gates Foundation, which you ran? You know, the first time I ever heard Bill talk about philanthropy was years before we started the foundations, before Bill's father started the William H. Gates Trust, which was the predecessor to, I then started the Gates Library Foundation in 96, I think. Bill Sr. started that in 94, 95 somewhere in that time range. Um, but the first time I heard Bill talk about philanthropy was at a Microsoft retreat at his uh, cabin on Hood Canal in the state of Washington. And, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the senior executives were there talking about the future all day. And then we would uh, hang out late at night and talk. And that evening, uh, it was clear that the stock was was increasing the wealth for all of us. And we got into a conversation about how much was enough. And Bill was the first to say, you can only have so many socks, you can only have, you know, so many uh, um, shirts. At a certain point, you have to take the excess and return it to society in the smartest way possible. And we had a, an extended discussion amongst us about how much was enough. After what point do you start to return it to society? And I remember for Bill, that number was very low. And that was when he was still getting uh, lots of feedback about why wasn't he more generous, why wasn't he doing more, but he was still in his 30s and he thought that he wanted to take philanthropy very seriously and do it right and that that would be something he did later in his career. But when I uh, uh, 
quit Microsoft. And then when Bill Sr. was also doing all of this great work out of, out of a cardboard box in his basement, both Bill and Melinda became increasingly aware that perhaps they could start a lot earlier and got engaged uh, on on these issues, uh, the big issues that drive their philanthropy now in 97, 98, and 99. How long, you, you started it, how long were you there? I was there, oh, I, I've, I still feel like I'm there, right? I'm still very committed to the issues that they're pursuing. But I was there from the very beginning, of, I, I left Microsoft at the end of 96, so the start of 97 through when Bill left uh, Microsoft in 2008. How much money did you have when you started? Well, at the very beginning, I went and spoke to Bill and Melinda about this idea they had that we could connect every library in the country to the internet. And we, you know, did back of envelope and they said it could cost 100 million, but let's put in 200 million so that if you want to do a lot of international work, we're ready and then when you know if you need more, you can come back to us. So we started with with a large amount of money at that time, a commitment of 200 million dollars to ensure that every library in the country was connected to the internet with the hardware and the software and the knowledge and the training to ensure that everyone in the country that wanted access to the knowledge uh, on the internet could get it, that wanted access to the tools that a, that a personal computer uh, could provide, could get it at their local library. Every so, library in the country? Every library in the country over the and over the next six years. And what did you spend that years. money on? We spent that money on uh, on personal computers. Every library ordered a, a series of computers, depending on what size population they were serving, and we spent it on training. We trained thousands, tens of thousands of librarians across the country because librarians had their hands up, saying, well, "This is part. This revolution is about what we stand for. It is about the idea that knowledge and access to knowledge is important for all citizens." And yet there was an in, in a large large group of citizens that were being uh, locked out, if you if you would, because of the cost of connection, the cost of the computer, and often the complexity. And so we had this young group of, I like to call them the Internet Peace Corps, that went out across the country, whether it was in Alabama or Idaho or, or New York City, and connected um, computers to the Internet and trained librarians and worked with communities uh, to ensure their public libraries became part of increasing knowledge. But from the time that you had a couple hundred million dollars to today, how much money is in the till today for the Gates Foundation? Well, I think they're over $35 billion, but that number is actually understated because Warren Buffett has committed his wealth, which is an equal amount, if not higher now, uh, to the to the to the work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and he transfers that wealth every year to the foundation, and they spend it in the following year. So their actual giving power is many billions of dollars. When I left, we were we uh, the philanthropy uh, that actually went out into society, went to institutions, went to organizations, went to projects, was about three and a half billion dollars a year. Why'd you leave? Well, we had this wonderful opportunity at uh, the foundation to start with a blank sheet of paper and say, what were the big problems in the world and what did we want to do about them? And we landed uh, on global health and made some enormous strides, whether it's in vaccination or in, in research and development on an AIDS vaccine, on a malaria vaccine, on work on reproductive health, and then here in the United States on U.S. education reform. And I was very proud of that work. Um, and, I, and I performed that job as a volunteer because I had been lucky enough to make more than I ever dreamed I would at Microsoft and was looking for a way to return um, what I had to society, but also use the skills that I built in the techno technology world. And I had two skills to offer that job. One was I did understand the way that technology was changing the world, whether that was in biotechnology or in information technology, and how we might be able to stand on the shoulders of all of that progress to see what could be done to address the needs of of the poor in the in the world. Um, so that was one advantage, and I knew how to run a business. But the second and the major advantage was I had the trust of Bill and Melinda Gates, right? And I had the partnership that they needed, the same as Bill's dad, the trust and partnership uh, that would help them in this very early stage of creating a foundation. I didn't have any experience of philanthropy of that scale. 
Um, so I was able to do that while the children were little and Melinda was able to focus on, on the children and increasingly was taking on a bigger and bigger role at the foundation. And Bill was able to focus on Microsoft. And we did an enormous amount of the work and decision making on email. In fact, when I worked on the archive of what, what, what decisions we made and why we made them, they're almost all documented in email conversations because he was across the lake at Microsoft and, and she was uh, balancing, you know, raising three young children and her work at the foundation. And, but there came this moment when Bill was ready to leave Microsoft and, and the children were growing up where you could see that the two of them were ready to be that daily presence, that daily guiding force. And my role was a lot less necessary. So, you know, I think even the best jobs in the world, there's a time when you say, this is not, I'm, I'm not as needed as I was. And that was a good time for me to, to uh, pass the baton completely to them and move off stage. When did you last get a salary? Well, I think it's, I, I guess probably Microsoft was my, was my last regular salary. And what year was salary. that? Did you, did you 1996. <clears throat> um, but listen, I have been uh, enriched beyond uh, what I deserve, not only by Microsoft, but I was lucky enough when I announced I was leaving Microsoft in 1996 that one of the early calls was from a guy named Jeff Bezos who said, you know, do you, oh, we are starting to form a board. We haven't gone public yet. Would you like to join uh, me in this organization called Amazon? And so I joined the board of directors of this little book publishing, uh, book uh, distributing company called Amazon.com, which was, a, again, across the lake in Seattle. And I've been on that board for 17 years. So once again, I've been able to participate in the market-based growth uh, based on technology and on the innovations that this country um, is, you know, supportive of, and 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 that prosperity has allowed me to make decisions that other people might not be able to make. Let me divert just for a moment to education because you graduated from a Midwestern state school. Uh, Bill Gates didn't graduate from college at all. Did Jeff Bezos? No, Jeff Bezos has a very uh, a good pedigree. And uh, did Steve Job graduate, Jobs graduate? I don't think he did. No, I don't and, think he did. And Mr. Zuckerberg didn't graduate from, from uh, college? Well, the, uh, it, it isn't because they couldn't get in. It was because they got d distracted no, along I, the way. My point of all this is that, uh, you know, we always hear about the Ivy League schools uh, being so important, but you have made the Microsoft crowd, the Apple crowd, the, the, uh, the made a lot of money given a lot of money away and you didn't need a fancy degree to do this. What good is the education degree then? Well, I would not underestimate how much those fancy degrees and the people that went to Stanford and Cornell and Harvard were part of the engine of Microsoft. We were able to recruit on the best campuses. We were able to find people like Melinda French from Duke. And they, those folks and their knowledge of not only how society would work, but how history has worked and how uh, technology can work really did fuel the engine at Apple, at Microsoft, and at Amazon. That said, I do believe that there are multiple ways of learning and I am you know still learning now you know I am by nature someone who wants to absorb as much information as possible and try to problem solve and and um, and 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 understand the puzzle whether that puzzle is you know poverty in uh, in Washington DC or its global health issues in Bangladesh those kinds of puzzles are interesting. The same was true, I think, of Steve Jobs, of Bill Gates, of Jeff Bezos. That kind of problem-solving uh, passion is what's fueled so much innovation in this country. I'm just lucky to have been able to apply it to social causes. Let's go back to the question I asked you a long time ago about money. What happened to you here as you began in the brain, as you began to be worth a lot of money, and I mean, obviously, you haven't uh, taken a salary uh, for a long time. But what what did you think of money after all this? After coming from a family of nine? Well, there's no question that people who made money rapidly, like I did, who came from ordinary backgrounds, but extraordinary in in many ways in terms of the family that I was lucky enough to be born into, but ordinary backgrounds, and then suddenly have extraordinary wealth. That the wealth can either absorb you or you can look at it dispassionately and say, what do I want to do with this? And for me, like many of the, my fellow Microsoft alums, 
um, I really looked at the idea that I needed to be super clear about what was my passion, what could I be really good at, and then I had the privilege of not having to worry about the resource engine. So when you see young journalists today and they have a passion and they think they can be the best in the world at, they worry about whether there's a resource engine that's going to fuel them sending their children to school. What about their grandchildren's needs? Um, I was lucky enough that the resource engine got taken care of very quickly because of the sudden rise of information information technology stocks and the idea uh, that entered about the same time as these technology companies uh, were created that stock should be shared with a range of employees. That was a relatively new phenomena and I was lucky enough to be advantaged by both a fast rising industry and a new idea that employees were shareholders by the by the very nature of the contribution they were making at the company. So I was able to look at that money you know, somewhat dispassionately and say, how can it fuel my passion? How can it fuel what I think I'm really good at? And came back to the idea of continuing to work and work hard, but be able to be careful about picking the work that really advanced my passions and that I really thought I could be pretty great at. Let's go back to what you do now, Martha's Table. Uh, what? When were you first motivated to even take this job? And you've been there, what, six, seven months? Yeah, so I started on April 1st of this year, and I'd had a, a couple of years from the time that I stepped down as uh, CEO of the Gates Foundation. I was still very active with the issues that that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett were funding, but I was also uh, working hard at the Smithsonian Institution where I accepted the role of chair, which was a three-year term. And so I realized that I, I wanted to dive all the way in and get the full benefit of what amazing things are go on every day at the Smithsonian, but also be able to support them in their growth and their change as they changed out leadership, as other kinds of governance issues were going on that required my paying great attention. But that allowed me a couple of years of break. I say that it was like I was like a plant that needed to be repotted and it was looked healthy enough but you put it in a new pot and I grew even more. And in the process of that growth I also went back and looked at what did we accomplish at the Gates Foundation? What were the good decisions, the bad decisions, what went on in the world as we did it? And one thing that struck me and that bothered me was during this period where I thought we made enormous strides on childhood immunization. We made great strides on AIDS treatment and on and AIDS prevention. And, and we made some strides on U.S. education reform. The number of American children living in poverty rose. And I thought that just, I didn't understand it. How could that happen? I know that part of it was the, was the recession and the economic climate that we were in. Uh, but I still thought, how could this country, uh, when I've been around the globe and seen the problems in other countries and always come back here and said, you know, if not here, where can we address this issue? And looking at the issues of multi-generation poverty and thinking back to the supports that I saw in the community I grew up in, I wanted to understand more closely what does it take for one family to change their life? What does it take for one mother and one child to break that cycle of poverty, to get the right education, to get the access to the to the career that will be game changing for that family. And I was a donor to Martha's Table. Like so many of your uh, viewers, you know, I would do, Michael and I would do the annual consideration of the things that we care about because they were important to us as we grew up, the issues that we cared about because they match our broader beliefs, but also the players in our community that we saw doing good work every day. And Martha's Table delivered hot meals to the little park outside the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation DC offices, McPherson Square. And I would see that van every night and I would see the lines of people there every night. And I knew that it was in volunteer driven, 10,000 volunteers, just 80 hardworking staff and that they had enormous influence in the community that they were serving and it was a great brand and I thought why wouldn't I join that organization see if I can put my skills to work but also see if I can understand better why do we have this issue persistent child poverty why do we have so many children that aren't 
graduating high school, going on to college, and being able to attach to careers the way that I was able to. You know, the one thing it, it seems to me that is almost never talked about, and I'm sure I'm wrong about this, but this is just to my ears, no one really homes in on the fact that 70% of the children in the black community are born, born out of wedlock, that the total national uh, average is 40%, and that when we talk about all the, and I've read a lot of the background on the stuff, it, it comes down to these kids don't go home at night and find two parents there, or even one. Well, uh, I, I, and how, how do you deal with, what happened to us? Because that wasn't the way it was when I was growing up. Well, I don't actually pretend to understand why so many young women are making the choice to have their families alone. But I do know from Martha's Table that even those single women have to assemble the kinds of supports that I had to assemble to be a working mother. I was lucky, you know, that I did have a, a spouse that was very passionate about the children and childcare, but I see at Martha's Table the grandmothers, the aunts, the sisters, and oftentimes the brothers or the uncles, and in many cases we have custodial fathers um, because some Thing happened with the mother-child relationship and it takes far more than one person to successfully raise a child whether you're Patty Stone Cipher or whether you're uh, a, a, a wonderful parent at Martha's table and the critical need is for them to assemble that same kind of supportive network that we had in our traditional family structures um, for for a wide range of reasons I think they don't see the same value in the in the in the persistent family structure that we did. But where do you think, from watching the world in the last uh, 30, 40 years, where does this come from? Because we've definitely, the, the numbers just keep going up, up, up uh, uh, very fast as to having people that are born out of wedlock. <clears throat> I'm not sure I know the answer. I do know that uh, poverty and lack of education changes outlooks for everyone. And I certainly, in, in choosing a spouse, was thinking about the life that we could build together and seeing his potential both as a partner but also as a parent. And I'm guessing that there's something in that value proposition that isn't, that isn't working for people. It's either not working for the young men, which we know that young men raised in poverty are having a, a lot of issues, especially minority young men, attaching to college at, in, in large numbers, attaching to successful career in large numbers. And I'm glad to see some of the foundations and the social service organizations trying to address the needs of minority young men to ensure that they're on a path to success because part of success, yes, is work and citizenship, but it's also parenthood. And, and you know, figuring that out and turning that cycle around is part of what organizations like Martha's Table but many other organizations need to dive into. I'd, 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 I'm not an expert on the root cause, but I can look around and see there's work for us all to be doing to ensure these young men and young women uh, enter into successful family uh, structures that can support their needs because nobody can do it alone. Where does the name Martha come from? Um, Martha and Mary were sisters in the Bible, uh, not Jesus' mother Mary, but two sisters that were along the, um, the path when Jesus was out doing his uh, 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 preaching. And uh, Martha was the one who stayed in the kitchen making dinner while Mary sat with the apostles and listened to all the great teachings. And Martha made the mistake of complaining to Jesus and saying, look, I'm, I'm stuck here back in the kitchen. And he conveyed that that was where the highest value was. And so 33 years ago when, uh, um, when the two folks, a social worker and a Jesuit priest came together to create Martha's Table, uh, which is not religiously based, they chose to use the name Martha's Table to designate the dignity in being one who serves. How many people work there? Uh, there's just about 80 of us that work there full time. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are 10,000 volunteers, some of them in grade school making peanut butter sandwiches, but also at four o'clock every night, we have volunteers who arrive to drive the vans into the parks. We have um, children from the local grade schools come in to be reading buddies with the children that are in the child care system. We have thrift stores that serve people who need um, uh, free or low price clothing. And we have people in there hanging up 
things on hangers every day and bringing their clothes in. So we rely on the whole community uh, to make Martha's Table work, but only 80 of us come in every day. How many people do you serve every day in some way? So I think the number that we end up touching every day is about 2,000. We've expanded recently our grocery program. A lot of people think of Martha's Table as a soup kitchen, but the truth is that we do far more grocery distribution than we do hot meals. We do both, but we know that most hunger and poverty is actually in the home. It's in the empty cupboard at the end of the month. It's in the a mother who is cutting back her own meal to ensure the child in the third and fourth week of the month has enough to eat. Uh, and these recent SNAP benefit cuts make that even worse with many of the same families we serve, you know, this month receiving 5%, 6% less um, uh, food stamps than they had received before. So we distribute groceries in the third and fourth week of the month in over 11 different school locations to ensure that low-income families with children in school can have the groceries in the cabinet they need to ensure the child's development and the family's health. Is there any uh, government taxpayer money in Martha's table? Yes, you know, the uh, early child care, which I think is something that's extremely important. We have learned so much over the last decade about the importance of that even, uh, even pre-birth, the prenatal period through age eight and how development during that period is so important. We have a very uh, successful early child care program that is supported in large part by the DC vouchers and we see early child care subsidy growing across the country although it's under under cuts with many of these recent uh, um, cutbacks in, in different states. But DC has a, a good program, many, many families on the waiting list, but we have uh, over 100 children aged 12 weeks to four years old that are there nine or 10 hours a day eating meals there, but also perhaps more importantly, working on all of the kinds of behavioral and developmental issues that we know children need to have in order to be ready to compete at age uh, four when they enter the formal school school system. And those subsidies really provide the base and then philanthropy helps us uh, take it to another level. As you know, I think it's, <clears throat> I'm not sure it's the district, but certainly this area has a f almost a 50% graduation rate out of college for people that live here. And you have statistics about the district that how many in the district are in poverty? Well, in the in the children in this district, it's it's half. You know, we have a, a strange distribution in Washington D.C. What I call a barbell distribution. That we have those of us who are lucky enough to be part of the of the system that has returned wealth in our generation at, at, at exceptional amounts, and then another big population that has really struggled. Uh, but that's not dissimilar to the greater communities around the country. I read recently that over half of U.S. jobs uh, are less than. 30 $34,000 a year. So what we're seeing is more and more uh, the families we serve are working families. They have one job, sometimes they have two jobs, and but they can't make ends meet because housing has risen uh, because uh, quality food prices are, are are not what's gone down. We've seen a, a great reduction in food costs for processed foods, uh, but but to buy that produce, to buy that protein is expensive. And so these are working families in many cases where there isn't enough food at the end of the month. 30,000 children in Washington, D.C. Uh, are in constant uh, possibility of hunger. 30,000 children in our nation's capital. And if we can count them, I believe we can address this. We need to do it through a series of supports, but we also need to make sure that food safety net is complete. Have you ever been on the government payroll? No, I actually had the privilege of chairing a council for um, for President Obama on community solutions. And that's part of what drew me to Martha's Table, seeing how communities um, perhaps even more than the federal government, we're starting to learn how to solve their own problems at home and, um, and, and how the solutions close to the communities they serve seem to be the most impactful. Uh, but that also was a volunteer activity. The reason I ask that is, that, what's your sense after watching this? Uh, are people more motivated when they do something like Martha's Table where they're volunteering and giving their money away? Or uh, do they, are they more motivated when they get the money from the taxpayer It's in the check every month? In other words, the, I know you, you think there's a, 
you know, a combination of some from the government, some from the individual. But what have you seen on the part of people that are involved in all this? Are they more motivated when they have to do it themselves? Or in the general public, because you, you were critical of uh, the reduction in the uh, SNAP program or the, the uh, uh, you know, the monthly stipend to people for food. Well, the SNAP benefits, it's important for people to realize that care about hunger and, and, and share our belief that no one really should be hungry in this country, that certainly no child should ever be hungry. We know that it has health costs and developmental costs that, that are just besides moral costs. And so if you, if you take the premise that children should not be hungry, you have to remember that SNAP benefits are 20 times the size of the entire charitable food network. It takes both because you don't want the government program to overreach and the safety net that is provided by the private sector to help uh, with the rounding error at the end of the month with the supplement is important. But if we start to see real cuts to that formal food benefit program that, you know, 40 million more than 40 million uh, Americans accessed SNAP benefits this year, and many for only a few weeks or a few months as their uh, family circumstance changed. If we see really deep cuts to that program, the, the private network will not be able to hold the need in this country, and people will go hungry even more than they do today, routinely hungry. To your question about the motivation, there's no question that all of us like to get out and serve. And that's a, a wonderful part of being a citizen. Uh, this kind of abstract idea of being a taxpayer and supporting those government programs and using our voice the way we should when things like food stamps are threatened, when WIC is threatened, when other programs that we know are successful that are means tested and only go to those in the greatest needs, when those programs are cut, we have to use our voice. But sometimes I think we feel like our voice is small and being able to make that sandwich or deliver that hot meal or chop those vegetables gives the feedback to the heart as well as the head that we need. And so some mix of those two seems the right way to serve your beliefs. So if we've watched this country in the last 10 years or so, we've spent trillions of dollars overseas in war. This area is very rich, as you know. The house values never went down here very much, <laughs> and they've gone back up. How can people, with all the money in this area, how can people in Washington, D.C. let 30,000 people uh, be in poverty and starve and have difficulty getting food every day? How is you know, that possible? You know, Bill Gates used to say this about malaria, but I'll say it about hunger. If they live next door, you wouldn't allow it. And what we're able to do if we don't get on the metro or we don't go down to Martha's Table or we don't go to the food distribution is we're able to forget that that need exists. And that is one of the positive outcomes of of volunteering and serving is that you remember uh, that this need exists in your community. And so, you know, while I know volunteering serves organizations like Martha's Table, I also think it serves us as citizens to remember where we are versus where we could be. You know, to think about Deborah, the, the veteran who comes to us every month looking for food at the end of the month, who the recent SNAP cuts have meant she's considering trade-offs like she used to do her laundry two times a month. Maybe she should only do it once and make things last a bit, a little bit longer just to make up the small cuts that took effect November 1. I can't imagine what Deborah's life would be like if those deeper cuts go or are made next year as budget conversations continue. And knowing Deborah and seeing Deborah's situation and knowing that she served our country would change almost everyone's opinion about what is the benefit and rationale for these food stamps. But in the District of Columbia, we could spend, I don't live in the district, but we spend $600 million on a baseball stadium. <laughs> Uh, the three of the members of the council are either in prison or had to leave the council because they were <clears throat> ripping off the, the community. Where is the judgment call, though, on the part of the city council here in, in the district to spend money for people that don't have food versus 
whether it's baseball or, or uh, all of the the six hundred thousand dollars they spent on greet the mayor day. Well, I, I don't know about the individual um, choices that are being made, but I do know something that surprised me because being from Seattle, I had was well aware of the challenges of the politics of D.C. government. And so I was delighted to learn that D.C. leads the way in people that are registered for SNAP benefits. It leads the way on breakfast in the schools, which is essential, really, for child development and learning. It leads the way on free and reduced lunches, and that this council actually is is proactive in thinking about how to keep more people from being dropped from the SNAP rolls. They're also very proactive in this mayor's office and in this council in thinking about these needs of early childhood, and how do we get more access to the subsidies that will allow that that Eric, one of the custodial parents that I was talking about, who has two jobs as a busboy and brings his young son to Martha's table and stays for an hour every morning to learn what should he be doing as a parent? How do we ensure that every Eric has access to a subsidy? That is the kind of thing that this council is actually struggling with. The key for us, though, I think, is to keep the voices heard of Eric, of Deborah, but also of people like you and me to make that trade-off between another entertainment stadium and uh, more of the supports that working families need to be successful and to make those trade-offs clear. They also have one of the highest truancy rates in the country in their schools here. Why is that? Well, we do know that for children to be successful in school, they have to be there right? And uh, they often aren't there because of situations in the family, because of illness, uh, but also uh, fam other family illness and transportation issues. And we have to whittle away at all of these issues. But we do know that having breakfast and lunch in the schools reduces truancy and that, that, that the family sees it as a benefit to make sure that child is, is fed and, uh, and taken care of. And so continuing to make school relevant to the young people to make sure that the additional benefits of, of, of nutrition and, and the right kinds of stimulus and physical activity are present too, I think will help us with the truancy rates. We've seen that across the country where breakfast has been introduced, that uh, truancy rates and attention is improved. What's the, uh, the budget for Martha's Table a year? So last year, Martha's Table spent about four and a half million dollars in cash, about half of that from government programs that support our education programs, and the other half both topping up the education programs and and buying the food and and supporting our programs and our uh, but the that four and a half million is then supplemented by people giving us their clothing and donating foods and all kinds of in kind donations that really help the engine go round. Personal questions now, not not uh, uh, policy questions. Your high point. And I'm going to ask you your high point that you would point to at the different organizations. When you were at Microsoft, personally, what was your high point? I think it was watching a small child sitting on two old encyclopedias in a library in order to sit up high enough to the computer to use Encarta. <laughs> the idea that this child was, was, was finding a way to... Uh, increase her knowledge uh, through exciting exploration on the PC meant that this idea of access to knowledge and personal computing was a reality. Your high point when you were on the CBS board. Wow, that is a really good question. Uh, I would have to say that there were multiple conversations that we got into about how MTV could use its reach and power to influence things like these dropout rates, to influence things like voting and the the ways that uh, that rock the vote and other programs of the reach of of media empires to help us all with this idea of being better citizens uh, was was a powerful part of that experience. High point on the Amazon board, and you're still there. There's nothing uh, like being on the Amazon board for constantly providing high points. But I have to say the idea that uh, the Kindle is allowing everyone at pretty low prices to have dozens of books and ideas going at all times uh, so that whether you're waiting in line at the DMV or you're sitting at home on the sofa, you can really explore whatever idea uh, you had that day. It's just very exciting and takes that early Encarta experience to a new level.
High Point on the Gates Foundation. Uh, are you still on the board there? No, no, I was never <coughs> actually on the board. I was always just the um, staff leader. Um, the board is, is Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett. It's a pretty, a pretty small group but with a lot of uh, influence. Um, no question the high point for me was meeting a grandmother in Delhi when I was out on a polio vaccine drive with the local Rotary Club. And this grandmother had a, a young girl on her hip that she'd come a long way to ensure that child got those polio drops. And this grandmother was disfigured from smallpox. She had been one of the last victims of smallpox, which as you know has been eradicated. And she wanted nothing more. She knew nothing about the idea of polio eradication or probably of smallpox eradication. But she wanted nothing more than to ensure that that grandchild did not suffer as she did. And seeing that that passion and that ability to bring technology and humanity together was like was like nothing else I've experienced. High point on the Smithsonian board. How long were you on the board? How long were you chair? I'm still on the board for another few days. My term as a Smithsonian regent runs out at the very end of December. And so uh, the term is for 12 years, two six-year terms uh, that the Senate and the House have to approve and the president signs off on. And so it was an honor and there were a hundred things that um, that were high points at the Smithsonian. But certainly one of them is something that I'm going to continue on. And I am still um, a board member for the new National Museum for African American History and Culture. And that is now a very large hole in the ground. The collection of African American uh, artifacts and heritage and storytelling is going on. But certainly the groundbreaking for that museum on the mall in the shadow of the Washington Monument, a mall that often had slave labor to build many of the of the buildings in this in this town with a President Obama, our first African American president, and to know that this beautiful museum will tell all of America's story and to be a part of making that decision of helping build that institution has been a highlight. When will it open? It's scheduled to open in 2015. We've got a lot to build and a lot to collect before then. How much money has been collected and how much money is needed? So we need just about 400 million. Half of that will come from the U.S. government from their pledge to match, and then 200 million from private uh, donors. And I know we're over 100, but we've got a long way to go, and we need resources from everyone in this country. It's important for people to realize this is not a museum for African Americans. This is a museum for all Americans to understand our history better. That's why it's right across from the American History Building, and again, right under under the shadow of the Washington Monument. I know it hasn't been very long, but what's the high point for Martha's Table? Well, there's no question for me that one of the things I've been able to do there was move from our monthly distribution of critical groceries to people in an alley to partner with a local nonprofit called the Latin American Youth Center and take over their gymnasium and turn it into a wonderful market style and to be able to see the change in people when they go from getting groceries in a bag and a line to being able to have a wonderful shopping experience where they pick the produce that they want and the the proteins that they want and they bring their cart along as they would at a grocery and the increase in dignity and the sense of of opportunity for everyone has been very gratifying and to know that those kinds of partnerships and those kinds of opportunities are part of what I'll do at Martha's Table over the next 10 years as I work to try to understand better what we need to do as a nation, what we need to do as a community and this little organization of Martha's Table. How old are your two children? I have a, a son that's 32, married to a wonderful woman of, of the same age, and a daughter that's 29. Both of them happen to work for the government. My son is a, a detective in the Missoula Police Department in Montana, and my daughter's here in town at USAID, and my daughter-in-law is with the U.S. For Forest Service. I also have two beautiful grandchildren. Mom and Dad, are they alive? Uh, my mother is alive in Indianapolis and probably watching this uh, show eagerly as she's very proud of all nine of, the, of her children. Uh, and my father passed about uh, 11 years ago. So we're about done, but I want to know the high point of growing up in a family of nine and what, when 
he would bring foster children in, what was the most that were ever in the house at the same time? Well, there was a period where we had a family of four that had had a, a tragedy of their own, losing a, uh, their mother and, and their father being incarcerated, so a family of four moved in with us, and that was challenging at times. But in terms of looking back at my family, I have to think that one of the highlights was at the time, I also thought, was one of the most embarrassing things ever, which is that we took our uh, summer vacations in a old school bus my father had converted. He'd actually wallpapered it on the inside, removed half of the seats, and we went from state park to state park across Indiana. Um, the girls would sleep inside on blow, blow up uh, uh, mattresses and the boys out in a tent. And my poor mother made uh, meals for all of us on a little stove, uh, a little camping stove. And I can only imagine how challenging it was for her, but it was a lot of fun for all of us. I've only got 30 seconds. I almost want to ask you what the high point of being married to Michael Kinsley is every morning at breakfast. The conversations we have when we're going through the papers as you did for so many years uh, uh, is just a great delight and he helps me be wiser and smarter every day. Patty Stonecipher has been our guest. She is the CEO of Martha's Table here in Washington and we thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Scripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. All this week, we'll bring you.